Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. What an exciting year this has been for AI. As part of the discussion today, we are going to be talking about how do we craft a culture of AI in our teams. Let's kick it off with some intros. I'm Govind Kaushal, your host and moderator for this session. Our planned moderator for this session unfortunately could not join, so I'm stepping in to host the session with an exciting group of panelists, Stacey and John. I'm a good product manager at Google, I'm part of one of the labs group at Google, where mission is to identify long-term opportunities for Google by focusing on advanced technologies. This year, my focus has been on AI, specifically focusing on AI applications in the enterprise domain, thinking about various ways in which AI is going to be increasing productivity across various organization functions. With that, let's get to know our panelists. Um, Stacey, do you want to go first? Sure. Thanks. I'm Stacy Cronin. Um, I work at YouTube, also a part of Google. Um, I'm the trust and safety team. So our team's responsibility is to identify and remove content that violates our policies and shouldn't be on the platform. And Gen AI has certainly been a big topic of conversation uh, in our in our uh, organization, both from a uh, potential abuse factor. You know, there's the potential for a lot of content to be created very quickly. Um, and then the creative aspects, right? How can Gen AI be a, a, a really powerful tool for our creators to create things that are more original or faster and easier to do? Um, so there's a lot of exciting opportunities that would be very beneficial. And then also on in our tooling and our ability to detect things and, and even to uh, simplify our tooling uh, for us to be able to identify uh, potential violations faster. So there's a lot of different uses uh, on all the different good and bad categories within YouTube. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction, Stacey. John, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm John Mark, uh, Product Director at Waymo, also an Alphabet company <laughs> in the family. And uh, I uh, lead product for what we call commercialization, which is basically how do we take uh, the self-driving car that works pretty well at this point and uh, scale it to hundreds and thousands of cars and build a uh, you know, ride share and delivery service with paying customers and all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, before this, I was at DoorDash for a bit and then Uber for a long while before that. So I've been kind of working in the logistics and ride share delivery space for about 10 years now. And yeah, it's been very fascinating to see AI um, evolution over that time. And obviously a big part of um, algorithms for matching and pricing at Uber that I worked on and uh, as well as at DoorDash. And then obviously uh, with self-driving cars, had a big impact on the technology behind um, how self-driving actually operates. Uh, and uh, and then also obviously on the commercial side as well, it's uh, lots of applications in terms of understanding customers better, understanding feedback, um, helping to design more intuitive uh, products that can better understand uh, individual customers and who they are and where they want to go and all that good stuff. So yeah, happy to be here. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you, John, for joining us. All right, so let's get started with a with a with an easy question. Um, we are all PMs here, so let's talk about how has AI influenced our lives. And maybe we can start off with um, John, uh, if you want to go first. If you can share an example on how AI AI has helped improve your personal productivity as a product manager. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, probably a couple. I mean, one big one is uh, is actually understanding uh, rider feedback. Like, uh, you know, back at Uber, when we used to look at all the ratings and the comments that people put in, and, you know, what was good about the ride, bad about the ride. A lot of that originally was very manually triaged by uh, kind of large numbers of humans or kept classified and categorized. And uh, we've had a lot of success um, starting to uh, yeah, use AI to understand uh, on the Wimo side now um, the uh, rider feedback and understand and try to uh, classify things and find patterns, um, actually things that humans didn't even pick up before. Um, so getting into sort of nuances is pretty fascinating to see. Um, we've definitely done some experimentation with um, helping to uh, write uh, documents, PRDs, help to uh, you know reuse content, put content together, remix it. Um, that's been pretty pretty cool to see. Um, I don't work as much on the autonomy side, but my colleagues on the autonomy side have obviously been using more advanced recent AI developments to uh, rethink how uh perception planning uh and uh maneuvering and all the kind of pieces of the economy stack work that that's very fascinating john um uh, you mentioned something around like you know helping 
helping getting the assistance in writing the PRDs. We want to elaborate uh, on that a little bit more. Like, what is what does the process look like for you, and what what does this look like, and what is it looking like now? Yeah, I would say I, I've been super happy with the results so far. But uh, maybe if you all have uh, something to point to, it'd be great. Um, but I think um, that there's a lot of potential there. I mean, when I think about PRDs, right? Uh, they all give us a different template out there. But a lot of the structure is very consistent, right? It's like, what is the problem statement? What is the opportunity? What are the things you're solving for? What are the constraints? And how do you think about different solutions and trade them off and size them to their good? As you all know. And so. Um, uh, what I've noticed uh, over the years is there's a lot of rope work that happens there from PMs, right? Where it's like you have to rebuild that, or yeah, there might be a template, but it's just a lot of grunt work sometimes to um, to pull things out, and then um, also to reference things um, and pull them into different places like um, presentation or some sort of program review or other kind of forums. And so for me, um, I think it's early stages, but I see a lot of potential in making the yeah, PMs a lot more productive. By helping to uh, craft documents more quickly, to summarize them, help you understand instead of reading a 20 page document, you know, help me understand this, write the TLDR for me, right? Writing a great TLDR, you know, that hopefully the machine can do even better at that than I can at some point. I cannot agree with you more. Uh, Stacey, over to you. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the summarization that, that John uh, mentioned is certainly something that, that I've made use of. Uh, often it's hard, it's, it's easy to write a long document of all of your thoughts, and it's hard to distill it into something a little bit more crisp that might be more appropriate for an executive communication or a short email update. And so, you know, doing your just thinking and writing and then and then invoking some some AI to help you summarize has certainly been helpful. Um, I think also on some of the creative fronts, right? So we've used it for naming, like. Uh, project naming or, or, you know, team naming and saying, and you can just have fun with it, right? Like, give me a name that's something like this, and then I'll make it funnier or, or make it, you know, more sci-fi or whatever you might want to do. Um, and similarly, uh, images, images and decks. So decks can get pretty, you know, boring. And so putting some interesting images has always been, I think, a really nice way to um, add some color. And I've had some fun recently. I, I had a, a big uh, update recently and I, I searched on the last page where I'm like asking for everybody's buy-in. I searched for an image that said, you know, leadership supports my plan. And it gave me this wild picture, just sort of abstract art. And I just put it in the slide and I was like, maybe it'll help. <laughs> and at least it looked interesting. So, and the review went well. So maybe it was the magic bullet. And uh, to build upon what you mentioned, Stacey, one of the things that I personally um, use, I've seen seeing myself using it quite a bit for, is to be able to provide a critique. So if I'm writing up a document, um, just making sure that you know it has been written in a format that uh, an audience, a targeted audience, uh, who might not have understanding of all the complexities, uh, all the all the nuances in the document, are able to clearly understand. And uh, this has been like really helpful. Uh, you know, there were days like when we used to get like PM peer reviews on the PRDs that we used to write. But I think now AI can actually be a really good co-pilot uh, helping us unlock that. So now uh, to extend that line of thinking, and maybe we can start off with you, Stacey. Um, what is your favorite resource to stay on up to date? It's just information uh, uh, overdose right now, right? Like every day there's like a new breakthrough that's happening. So yeah. share some tips that you have for staying up to date on what's going on. You know, I, I wish I had some like favorite podcast or great article or, or something to cite here. I think what I mostly do is, is talk to people um, and, and particularly some of the engineers and, hey, let's go have coffee. Let's go have lunch. And, you know, what's what's new and what's going on in your world? Um, things are changing really fast. Um, and some of it is you know, I will read articles in the paper and that's kind of the big picture and, you know, the, the drama of, of CEOs getting fired and, you know, all of that's kind of fun. But the stuff that really impacts my work, I mostly learn from talking to people on my team. And, um, and, and sometimes even before it's been officially like, yeah, we're sort of noticing that maybe it's, you know, we don't need a huge volume of labels, but we need some really high quality labels, particularly in this area. And I'm like, hmm, okay, we can go think about that and, and get kind of the early 
um, their early insight on, on how we might want to change our strategy from the product side to, to better serve the engineering side. But maybe I'll get some good recommendations from you guys too. Yeah, yes, John, do you have any tips that you want to share with us? Yeah, sure. I would say two things for me that have been super helpful. One is um, a curated list of uh, people I follow on Twitter, which I refuse to call X. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a bunch of yeah researchers, uh, startup founders, yeah, engineers, I would say that's where I often first heard about, like, oh my God, I can't believe they can do this now, you know, kind of chat GPT stuff or whatever. So I find Twitter is a great resource of, like, obviously people all over the world doing really cool stuff. And if you follow the right people, that can be helpful. The second thing that's been really helpful is here in San Francisco, there's obviously a lot of hackathons and on the side, I do some advising and investing. And so I'll just go to like a hackathon in San Francisco and talk to a bunch of engineers that are like hacking on something or people that are starting a company around something and kind of like through that ethos, absorb quite a bit of like the latest thinking what's going on. Got it. No, I think you guys covered a pretty good list. Uh, the only addition that I would make is um, I sign up for a bunch of these uh, TLDR type of newsletters that arrive in the morning, and that kind of like gives you a good overview of what has happened in the in the last uh, or the uh, a day before. So that's kind of like uh, making sure like you know nothing important uh, relevant to your work uh, is getting missed out. So that's a good starting point as well. All right, so now let's uh, get into some of the product design and the product management um, related topics. So uh, we are likely going to see uh, two parallel waves of AI influencing uh, product design. Um, the first one is likely going to be around AI getting incorporated uh, into existing products. And then the second one is going to be a new class of products that are designed with the AI first principles. Um, I think in this last year, we have definitely seen a lot of both of them, actually. We have seen uh, companies like you know, Microsoft, Google, uh, trying to incorporate AI into the existing products. We have seen a bunch of like new startups coming out, uh, which are really putting together the products which are AI first. So as a PM, uh, you may actually end up working uh, on a project over the next year that does one or the other. So what are the essential skills and knowledge you need as a PM uh, to be prepared. And maybe we can go start with you first, John. Yeah, um, so the question was like, what skills are uh, relevant to stay on the edge of that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, uh, I think as I think about it is there's like tactical stuff and strategic stuff and there's like different time horizons. Like we touched on a little bit of things like, yeah, help me summarize a document or this or that. And I think some of those things are, yeah, more short term. I think for me, the long term question that are interesting as a, as a PM or how does this sort of change uh, like user interfaces, right? Like, I think it's a big reason why it is existential for like Microsoft and Google because there is, you know, obviously there's been things like Alexa and Siri and they've been helpful for some specific things, but they certainly haven't replaced the Google search box, for example, right? Or like the kind of typical ways that people interface with their phone or their computer. Um, so a big one for me is like over the next, yeah, several years, decades, like how much do you see, uh, you know, um, potentially interfaces uh, between humans and computers changing, moving to voice or moving to other augmented ways of interfacing. And so like, how do you think about potential disruption to your product or right that would change radically or allow a competitor to more, uh, you know, efficiently kind of like interface with a customer? Um, that's a big one for me. Stacy, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it, it relies on some of the, the same core skills we use, we use for everything. I would say in particular, I would think about, um, understanding customer needs, um, and, and really thinking about product market fit, right? There's probably going to be a lot of really cool ideas that don't necessarily solve a customer problem or deliver a, a business benefit that, that you're looking for. And so I think, um, you know, having your, your spidey senses up for, you know, asking those hard questions like, yeah, this is pretty cool, but like, what is it doing for our customers or, or will people pay for this or how, you know, how might this actually support what we're trying to do um, will be an important question to be constantly asking yourself and building that culture within your team to be to be willing to question things and and experiment right i think there's there's a lot of there's probably going to be a lot of things that you try and 
you know, you might try 10, 12 things and, and one of them might be huge and, and the others might be kind of, you know, either duds or, or just not as much adoption as, as, uh, as you had hoped. So be willing to experiment and, and learn and, and see where the market goes. No, no, fantastic uh, responses from both of you. Um, the only thing that I would add, um, which I'm kind of like seeing working on a little bit of an experimental stuff, um, is really around like the, the the iterative cycle of the product development, which is typically, you know, in the software engineering, you have, you kind of like go through a very traditional path of like, hey, here are the requirements, here are the test cases, here's like the PRD, here's like, you know, how the engineering can actually plan the work. Um, and maybe this is a reflection of where the technology stands right now. Right now, in the if you're trying to work on an AI project, the things are going to be very iterative, where you really have to first start off from an idea, think about how you can quickly prototype and see what you're getting out of the box, and then be able to go, go through these cycles of quality improvement in certain hypotheses where you would may not find any, any luck, uh, any success, and uh, in certain cases you may. So it's going to be a little bit more of an iterative product development cycle, uh, at least for the next year. That is uh, what I would expect till the time the technology kind of like gets established and becomes uh, more and more mainstream. Um, so that's that's probably one of the observations that I've had in the impact of AI with respect to the product development. Now, uh, we actually do have an a interesting question coming in from the audience. Um, let's take that one. So the question is, um, how would you recommend driving change within engineering um, and more context on this question is uh, ai tools are going to drastically change how teams are structured but might result in needing somewhat different skill sets and even reductions uh, i have noticed engineering leaders adopting gen ai with different levels of commitment so with that context um, any insights uh, stacy uh, that you want to share that on how you would recommend driving change within the engineering organization? Yeah, I, I do think um, that there's, there's change coming, right, in terms of what are the skills that are needed. Um, you know, you know I, I, th I think it's also, I, I don't know, just thinking about my own experience and, you know, things that we've been talking about necessarily that we need smaller engineering teams or that some of the the tools that are, are going to eliminate the need for good engineers but i think um obviously folks who are good at building and 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 measuring and iterating on models is more and more important um so that skill i think is, is going to continue to be a really critical one and then you know building on some of the things that we were just talking about i mean there's still the role of the application engineer and the engineer who's thinking about what products do I build on top of this is is essential, right? But but building faster, more iteratively, understanding what the market could need, um, I, I think will be the direction. I, I I you know the question asked about engineering. I almost wonder, in my experience, it might be some of the other teams that are more impacted, places where we are more likely to use a lot of you know more more human labor to do things. Um, like we have, uh, you know, human reviews, human reviewers looking at content, and the more we automate, you know, the the fewer humans we may need, or or the different jobs that they may need to do, right? So the skill again may change um, in some of those operations support uh, types of roles for sure. That that's fantastic, uh, John. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think I just see that trend of engineers moving up the stack and it's sort of going away, right? But it's like, I'll beat myself, but I graduated from college in 2005. And like when I studied computer science, you know, a lot of it was still about data structures and like pointers and memory management and like all that good C++ stuff, which of course, and then before that, you know, it was like people writing assembly. And even then people were like, okay, you're not thinking about assembly, right? There's a lower level thing happening in the service. And now you're just seeing that move up more and more, right? Where it's like a lot of the basic blocking and tackling and, uh, that people used to have to like grind out right as engineers is like being done by the yeah, chat PMT or particular tools. So I think that actually frees engineers up that to think more about system design, architecture, uh, you know, kind of the higher level conceptual things that I think humans are often still better at and just get more leverage, get more done. Um, but I don't think yeah, it's gonna be a smaller team. I think, you know, 
I've always been engineer constrained, right? Like you guys probably the same way. Every year you have a roadmap, you'd love to do different things. And you're like, well, I'm gonna have engineer to do half of it, right? So maybe we can get more of it done, right? If we have like uh, more leveraged uh, engineers. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you both. Um, let's continue over to um, the, the next question, which kind of like fits in into the bucket that you were talking about, Stacey, which is like, you know, it's not just the engineering, but some of the other functions, uh, which are also seeing a change in the way that they do their day-to-day -day job. And as a PM, we actually get a chance to work with across functional teams, uh, whether it is design, legal, marketing, uh, business development. So for the purpose of this discussion, let's talk about the non-engineering um, uh, team members. Um, let's say if someone from marketing or business development comes to you and they're like, hey, I've heard this AI thing is going to change how we work. How much do I need to know and what do I need to know to stay stay up to date or stay relevant? What, Stacey, do you want to share your thoughts on this? It's a good question. I mean, I think a lot of the conversations are fairly technical so it might it might be more of a um, kind of demystifying it to someone who is in another function or even you know someone who you know socially and and I would maybe just start with you know what do you know about it and and you know people use it today and don't realize it right you know it's like I start typing in a search and it auto completes right like that is that's been around a long time and people are pretty comfortable with it and so you know, how do you make it feel familiar and not scary um, and think about the ways that it might make your life easier, right? When you're writing emails or um, design, I think design has a good opportunity to really use these tools um, for, you know, to, to expedite and, and expand the creativity of the work that they can do. Um, so I think grounding it in, in the actual experiences that a non-engineering person would would have with with AI would help kind of demystify and make it not seem like oh there's this weird crazy thing that I need to totally understand and you know just understanding and I think the more people understand it from the consumer side the more we can be thinking about what types of things do we want to bring into the world you know not just the how and the the models and the tuning but like what is this? What does this deliver? You know, and what 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 what, what can we imagine um, in in our hands? So, cannot I agree more? Um, John, do you want to add anything to it? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think similar to what we were saying about engineers being higher leverage. I mean, I'm seeing some of that. Like we're yeah, with marketing. Like how can I generate copy to test for ads or take copy from a successful ad campaign and riff on that and like further like find possible permutations, right? Right, uh, marketing briefs, all that kind of stuff. Again, higher leverage, same design as you were saying, Stacey. I think, you know, helping to generate uh, concepts or building blocks and uh, kind of like speed up the design process. Um, definitely a lot of interest in that as well. Great. So um, let's switch gears. Um, let's talk about, um, you know, as a PM, we are always thinking about the pricing of the products as well, which is, you know, do we what kind of revenue model do how do we want to make money out of what we are building right and um, every product goes through like a different journey to be able to come up with the right uh, revenue model as well as what the pricing for the end consumer should be now and this is a little bit of a futuristic so none of us uh, have seen the magic band uh, things may shift uh, next year but knowing what you know right now how do you foresee ai influencing the product pricing for the end users and, and to give some more context on this, um, you know, there is a definitely a common consensus at this point that AI is going to reduce the operational cost. And if you think about the product development process, uh, operational costs include like, you know, the amount of number of engineers that it takes to actually build something, the cost functional teams that it takes to actually put together the product. And if we are seeing productivity gains over there, uh, that would translate into uh, the, the, the cost of building a product uh, to go lower. Um, how do you see this playing out? Um, is it fair to say that uh, the end products uh, to the end consumers uh, will become cheaper? And let's start with Stacey. Sure. Um, well, I mean, we don't always use cost-based pricing. <laughs> so this could translate into more profit um, or more reach. 
you know, I think that is something that uh, you could potentially, you know, your product could just sort of expand more quickly to more people, more highly leveraged. And so you have these reduced costs um, to build and then, you know, you can, you can get it out to more people. Um, you know, there's also, there are some increased costs for compute uh, power and that can get quite expensive. And so depending on the demands of your model, there, the, you know, even though you're getting some efficiencies in one place, you could have some increased costs elsewhere. You know, what one one thought I have on this too is that it it reduces the um, cost to serve certain types of tasks, but potentially increases the value for others, right? So I could see potentially more kind of freemium type models or something like I'm reminded of the. Um, some of the mental health um, apps or, and, and services, right? You might start with a chat bot and you're talking to the chat bot and that's gonna get better and better. So you can get more and more people into a free or low price product, but that might create more demand for your higher price products, right? For your, your more um, specialized support from a, you know, from a one-on-one -on -one type of um, provider. So I could see both extending the, your funnel by having a really, you know, cheap and easy way to bring people in and, and at the same time driving value toward where do you need a higher touch experience for whatever it is or a more experienced uh, product or, you know, person. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't think everything will get cheaper, but there'll be yeah, some so opportunities. What I'm hearing from you, Stacey, is it's more nuanced um, and it's not um, one model fits all. Um, John, anything that you want to add? Yeah, and no, I agree with all that. I think, uh, yeah, it will vary a lot by vertical. I think, yeah, for SaaS products, right, like the the portion of the cost that this can cut out would be pretty significant. And like certain professional services, yeah, I do think there'll be dramatically cheaper access to tutors, to lawyers, to doctors, right? Something at the entry level type of stuff. And I think that's super positive. You know, where I've worked, like at Uber and, and Waymo, it's um, probably not going to change the price too much, right? With Uber, you still have to pay the driver, right? So even if AI makes product development a little cheaper or support cheaper. It's a small portion of the total cost of delivery a ride, right? Maybe the majority of the cost is the driver. So like, and then with Waymo, it's very asset heavy, right? We've got these expensive cars and sensors and and we still have infrastructure and charging and people that repair the cars and all that. So uh, again, I think it'll, it'll lower the R&D costs and some of the product development costs and make some of the product run in better. But um, a big part of the cost probably won't come down in the near term because of AI. Got it, got it. Awesome. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, discussion uh, today. I know we are right on time. Um, anything that you, anyone wants to add uh, before we close the session today? Stacey? No, I think this has been, it was uh, really fun to uh, think about these questions and I hope that it was interesting for people to, to hear some of the conversation. John? Yeah, no, I enjoyed the chat and I think it's, uh exciting time to be alive so uh enjoy it and make the most of it all right uh with that thank you both of you for joining us today and we can end the session now